Well, good morning. Welcome. Would you stand to your feet if you're able to this morning? God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy my. topic for this morning is based on worship, which I'm obviously thrilled that we are opening the word and, and going to learn and dig deeper into what God expects of us as worshipers. And we're going to do something a little different this morning. It's a response of reading. So you'll see the words on the screen behind me. I will say the first one, and then you will respond on the second line of each one. And we want to do this kind of like we're really excited to be here, right? And excited about the word and excited about the promises that we've just sung about that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. So you will recite after me. You, God, are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. Because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. At last, I shall be fully satisfied. I will praise you with great joy. I will praise you with great joy. We 
stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Oh Lord, we bow down, we bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He! And together we see. be seated. It is so good to be here to worship today, and I'm so thankful that you're here as well. I want to encourage you that you're here. Afterwards, you go to a Bible study class, and if you skip, you'll probably be assaulted in the parking lot. So just want you to know, just a precaution. But uh, we are so glad you're here. It's a beautiful day in South Florida, as opposed to Pine Mountain, Georgia, where it's probably raining, and my in-laws live. But uh, <laughs> just to mention, but uh, I'm so thankful you're here. I want to let you know what's going on this week. Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we have Father Knows Best Bible Study. We watch a, a series, uh, a segment of the series, uh, Father Knows Best. Then we have a Bible study based on that. But we also have a meal served at 515. Now, this week is, because I know this is more important than anything else to y'all. We're having chicken pot pie and biscuit and cookie from KFC. So, uh. But you got to call and sign up. It's five dollars, and uh, call, and we'll have that at five fifteen. We'll have the Bible study at six. It's going to be a great time. But it's going to be a great time of worship right here. And I'm so glad to be here today, and I'm glad you are too. Let's stand together and worship.
leadeth me. He leadeth me. Oh, blessed thought, oh, words with heavenly comfort from. Whatever I do, wherever I be, still by God's hand. Jesus. 
sing about those final days I hope it's an encouragement for us not to wait for eternity to offer our worship to the Lord but it being a daily sacrifice our praise being lifted up to the only one who is worthy don't wait till our knees bow before him but wait each day upon the Lord and worship him in spirit and truth letting your amen letting your praise fill this temple and filling our lives with his presence each day for he is worthy church church said amen Amen. he's worthy please be seated
And all God's people say Amen. We still worship him, don't we? I want you to take your Bible, if you will, and turn to Luke chapter 4. I'm really excited about the, the subject we're talking about today. We're, the, the title is Why Worship? We're going to talk about worship today. And, and I hope that, and by the way, I've given you notes. Uh, some suggested that since you guys have not been keeping notes, and I'm giving you way too much. i got to whip you into shape. So try, try to take the best notes you can. I just got so excited, I gave you a whole bunch of them today. So you may be writing all afternoon, <laughs> too, but that's okay. If you miss something, you can go online and pick up the rest, and that'll be fine. But I'm excited to be able to uh, share with you my, uh, the notes today. I, I'm a teaching pastor, and, and I need to share notes with you, and um, so I'm excited to be able to do that. You know, years ago, I was uh, speaking to some children at a summer camp, and and it was really a cool experience, and I was leading a session on worship along with the worship pastor. And we asked the children this question, what does worship mean? What does it mean? We asked the children. We wanted to get response from them, and then we were going to share with them, teach on that subject. So little children were asked what worship means, and one of the kids spoke up, and said these words, I think that we have it for you on the screen. Let's go ahead and, and put that up for you. That child says, worship means Jesus is better than anything else you got. Wow. Can you imagine that? A little child said that. On that day, in that session, I didn't have anything better than that. Let me tell you. That child outdid me real fast. And uh, But that was exactly right. It's a pretty good answer, I think. And that is that Jesus indeed is is better than anything else you got. And that's why we worship. And that's why we worship the Lord even today. It's because we recognize in our heart of hearts that there is nothing better in our life. There's nothing more important in our life than Jesus. And that is why we worship him. And so today, we're going to deal with that subject. I'm going to try to give you a little bit more details and, and add a little bit of meat to the bones of this. But, but I think that... Uh, that you would recognize from the outset that he is worthy of our greatest worship. Amen, church? Indeed he is. And, and so what we're going to do, we're going to look at a passage, Luke chapter 4, and, and beginning in verse 14. And, and this is where we get a glimpse of Jesus' own public worship experience. What did Jesus think about public worship, about gathering with God's people? Well, this passage gives us an answer to this. In Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, it tells us, Jesus... Returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in the synagogues and everyone praised him. At least for now, right? Verse 16, he went to Nazareth. Remember, that's where he was, he was raised. It says where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. This is his home church, his home synagogue. And notice what it says, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and, and unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. In other words, he, we would say, turn in your Bible to a particular one. Jesus had them turn to that passage in Isaiah where it says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim Freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 800 years before Jesus, this was a prophecy that would come from the lips of Jesus. And that's what he read. Verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is a reading from sacred scripture, and all God's people said, amen. amen. I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. Let's open our hearts to him in prayer as we begin to understand this passage. Heavenly Father, we do come before you, and God, we know that you are worthy of our highest worship. You're, in, uh, you're worthy of the, the greatest attention, the greatest affection that we could share with you. And so, Father, we pray that today that you might teach us about worship and, and how to honor you the very best that we can. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. May your word come alive in our lives. And, Father, we pray this now in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. 
Well, I want us to get right to it. What is it that we can learn from worship from this passage and from other uh, verses like this? Well, the first thing that I would say to you today is that worship is vital. If you're taking notes, write that down. I'm going to have to prompt you all today. You're not used to writing, so I'm going to have to prompt you as we go along. Worship is vital, uh, which is to say it's important. It's a necessary. It's essential. And, and, and we need to realize that. We can't dismiss worship as being unimportant or non-essential. We live in a, in this past year, we've talked about what is essential and what's non-essential. Well, I'll tell you today what is essential, and that is the worship of our Lord God. And, and we need to understand that. This is important in my life. It's important in your life. It is the very heart of who we are, and, and we need to understand that. And the reason I say that is, first of all, because, and we'll put this on the screen for you, because we are constructed to worship. We are constructed to worship. You know, things are crafted for a purpose. Anything you got in your house has probably has some purpose. I have things in my house, admittedly, I don't know what they're for. I don't know what they are, but if I know what they are, they have some purpose. Uh, that's true for, the, for shoes. Uh, shoes are there to walk in, chairs to sit in, beds to lie down in. And your heart was crafted to worship in. That's why God created your heart, was so you could worship him. Is Blas Pascal, who said this, the French philosopher said this, and we'll put this on the screen for you, and that is there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man that cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus. There is indeed a God-shaped void in your life that can only be filled by him. I remember when I was a teenager having a, 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 such a wonderful teen years. I enjoyed the teen years. I played sports. I had great friends and, and great relationships. And, but there was something that was missing in my life. There was something that, that I needed in my life. And that is when I began to deepen my worship experience. That's when I began to have a quiet time daily and began to really take serious worship when I gathered with God's people publicly because I knew that was only, only God could fill that void in my life. It was a revolutionary experience. For me as a 14-year-old, realizing there are some things that only God can fill in your heart, and you need to turn to him to experience that. You see, our hearts are crafted. They are created for the purpose of worship. The psalmist said in Psalm 22, verse 3, he said, God inhabits the praises of his people. It means God lives in the praises of his people. As we worship him, that is when God comes alive in your inner experience. When we come to, to speak to him words of, of praise and, and honor and glory, that is when he comes alive in our experience deep within. And that's what we need to realize. Just as the eyes respond to light and the ears respond to sound and your lungs respond to air, the human heart responds to God. Worship is our response to God's presence. Let me say it again. Worship is our response to God's presence. That's the way God created you. That's the way God crafted you. And unless you realize that and experience that, you're always going to feel like something is missing in my heart. There's something inside of me that just isn't right. You need to experience God. We're just constructed that way. We're just crafted that way. One of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 42 Verse 1 says this, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul thirsts for you, O God. And that's true. You need God. You need strength that can only be found in God. And we need to realize that. Now, the reason I say all this is that in our passage of Scripture in Luke, we, we see in verse 16, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, we'll notice here that, that Jesus worshipped in the synagogue, and it says, and I quote, as was his custom. As was his custom. This is what he did. On the Jewish Sunday, on the Jewish Sabbath, where would Jesus be? He would be in church. He would be in the synagogue, as was his custom. You see, public worship was the steadfast habit in the life of Jesus. Now, this is especially important when you realize that in the context here, this worship experience came on the hills of his wilderness experience. Do you remember that? Forty days, Jesus had been out in the wilderness. There, he was tested and he was tempted. 
This was not an easy time for Jesus as God the Father was preparing him for his ministry. And here's the thing. Immediately after this, Jesus was back in worship. He was back in church. Jesus were, if Jesus were in need of worship to find strength for another day, what makes you think that we can make it without worship regularly in order to face our days? Let me say it again. If Jesus were in need of private prayer as well as public worship to find strength for another day, what makes you think that we have the strength without our private prayer experience as well as our worship? I am just telling you today that God constructed you to worship. Not only does God construct, construct you to worship, but we are also instructed to worship. We're instructed to worship. Write that down if you're taking notes. We find in Scripture that there are literally hundreds of verses that instruct us to engage in public worship. There's a whole book that is dedicated to that, the book of the Psalms. Do you realize those were the songs of worship for Israel when they gathered together? That was the very purpose. Those were the songs. That was the, the hymn book of, of the Hebrews for, for thousands of years. And so we are instructed to worship in Scripture as well as in the Psalms. We are instructed to do that. Why? Because Psalm 48.1 says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. It's real simple. He's worthy of it, right? Uh, There's nothing more important that you can do when God's people gather for worship. There's nothing more important that you can do in your life than to worship the Lord. It is the most important thing that we can do when it comes to, to the public gathering of God's people is to worship Him. And we are instructed to do that. We're instructed to worship in our private prayer life, to do that daily, but also in our public worship experience. Now, do you think it matters how we worship, when we worship? What do you think? Have you ever showed up in church and not done church very well? You ever done had that experience? I know you have because I can see y'all out there. Okay, I'm just telling you. Right now. We've all had that experience. You know, we've had a we, we, we're worn out, we're tired, we show up at church, and pastor, you ought to be just glad I'm here, you know? No, I'm never satisfied with that. I want, you to, I want you to experience God in this place. I want this to be a place where you can hardly wait to get here and to be with God's people so that we can experience God in this place. Indeed, the scripture instructs us not only that we are to worship and gather for public worship, but it tells us how we're supposed to worship when we show up for worship. You say, well, what, how are we supposed to do this? Well, first of all, we are to be zealous with our worship. We are to be zealous with our worship. The psalmist said in Psalm 145, verse 1 and 2, he said, I will exalt you Forever and ever. Does that not sound like zeal to you? If there's one place you ought to have zeal, it ought to be in this place. If there's one thing that you ought to be enthusiastic about, it is the worship of the Lord. You know, the very word enthusiasm comes from two Greek words. In theos means in God. The word enthusiasm comes from the Greek words that mean in God. Those of us who are in God, we ought to be zealous. We ought to be enthusiastic about worship. Can I get an Amen. I better get an amen. I watch a lot of sports unapologetically, and I'm enjoying watching baseball and, and gathering with people again. I mean, last year, man, it was slim pickings, wasn't it? I mean, I was even watching cornhole uh, contests. You know, that's how bad it got, you know. You ever watch cornhole? I mean, anyway, you know what I'm talking about, but... I'm enjoying watching. I went and saw the Marlins play. I love gathering with people again. I mean, it's fun. But I'm telling you, when I watch it on television or I experience it in person, those people are excited to be back at the stadium or to be back at the arena. They're, they're enjoying being there. We have so much more reason to be excited because we are in the presence of a God who loves us. Can I get an amen? Amen. We ought to be zealous when we gather for worship. We ought to be zealous. Secondly, we ought to be joyous in our worship. The psalmist says in Psalm 100 verse 1, he says, Shout for joy to the Lord. Isn't that great? Shout for joy. When's the last time you shouted for joy in church? Some of you, if you shouted for joy today, you'd scare the person next to you. They, they wouldn't know what happened. But we ought to be joyous. We ought to be joyous. Listen, I had my grandson here last week. Admittedly, not in this service, but in the late service. 
And my, my son tells me, he says, you know, one of the things he always does, during, my, my son David likes to bring him to big church. And he said, my, my, he said, my, son, uh, my, my son Cash always tells, my, my grandson Cash always tells my son David, this is boring. He says he does that every, every, every Sunday, whatever, you know, wherever they are. But he didn't do that Sunday, and I watched him, and he was really excited to be in worship. He felt the joy, and that made me very happy. I want my grandson to know that this is a place where we are zealous about worship, and we're joyous in our worship. We ought to be zealous. We ought to be joyous, and it ought to be contagious. That's the third thing here. It ought to be contagious with our worship. I love that psalm, Psalm 122, verse 1 that says, I was glad when they said unto me, what? Let us go into the house of the Lord. Let's say that together. Let us go into the house of the Lord. My goodness. It ought to be contagious. It ought to be the kind of thing when people show up at this place, they want to be in this place because the people here are so zealous, they're so joyous, it's just contagious. That is the way we ought to be worshiping the Lord. Amen? Amen. You know, George Whitfield was the Billy Graham of his day, and his day was the Great Awakening. Some of you have heard of George Whitfield. He was literally the Billy Graham in America. He traveled all over America, and wherever he gathered, thousands would come to hear him out, and most of it outdoors. They didn't have, they didn't have places to hold the people. And, and, the, and as, as the Great Awakening spread across America, they would come and hear George Whitfield preach. And one of the guys that would show up was not a Christian. Never became a Christian, as far as I know, but you know him. His name was Benjamin Franklin. You guys ever heard of Benjamin Franklin? Yeah, a good man, wrote a lot of wise things, never became a Christian. Now, he was a deist. He believed there was a God that somehow mechanically started up the, the world and left it here, but he was never a Christian. But when George Whitfeld was anywhere near Philadelphia or wherever Benjamin Franklin was, he would go and hear George Whitfield. And someone came up, according to Franklin, someone came up to him one time and said, said, Mr. Franklin, I did not know that you believed. And he said, I don't believe, but he believes, and that's why I'm here. He was drawn to George Whitfield. There was something about his sincerity. There was something about his preaching. There was something about that open-air worship that, that drew him, and he would go to, to great lengths to be there, and he loved Whitfield, and Whitfield loved him. It was attractive to him. Listen, we live in a community where there's so many people who don't know the Lord. It would thrill me if so many of them would come into this place, whether they have come to believe yet or not. They would come in here and they would be drawn because of the contagiousness of our worship. Amen? Amen. Our worship ought to be contagious. It also ought to be continuous. It ought to be continuous. It says in Psalm 113, verse 3, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord shall be praised. Uh, that's a good verse because it te teaches us it's not just on Sunday, but it's every day and throughout the day that we are to be worshiping the Lord. Isn't that right? I, I have to tell you, and, and th this may this may sound strange to you, but I can usually tell the kind of I can usually tell the people that practice a quiet time because of the way you worship. If you practice a quiet time daily, when you come to worship, you know how to worship. And, and it makes all the difference in the world. It's not only something that we ought to do on Sunday, but every day you need to worship the Lord and find ways to do that. I love when I'm driving. Some of you may see me driving along, and you may see me talking. I'm not talking to myself. I'm not cursing out the driver next to me, I'm telling you. A lot of times I am worshiping the Lord. I love to worship the Lord as I move along. I have worked on sermons while I'm driving to work or driving around, going to hospitals and places. I am telling you that it's not something that we just do on Sunday. It's something that we're to do every day and in every kind of way. Can I get an amen on that? It ought to be continuous. It also ought to be, con we also ought to be conscientious about our worship. Conscientious about our worship. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know... Some of us need to prime the pump when it comes to worship in our lives. Some of you, when you get up in the morning, uh, your most natural thing to do right away is not to say, praise the Lord, it's another day. And some of you just trying to find the alarm clock and hit the snooze button, you know. And, and some of you don't do much until you have your coffee in the morning. I, I know how this works. Uh, we have to kind of prime ourselves. We have, to, we have to bring awareness to our own hearts of our need for God daily. 
And that is why the psalmist said in Psalm 103, verse 1, he says, praise the Lord, O my soul. He's talking to himself, or O my soul, and all that is within me, he's saying, praise his holy name. He is saying to himself, you need to praise his holy name with everything that is within you. We need to prompt ourselves and be conscientious about this. We ought to be zealous. We ought to be joyous. We ought to be contagious and continuous and conscientious, but we also ought to be victorious in our worship. In Psalm 47, verse 1, it says, Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. And all God's people said what? Can I get a shout? Can I get a, can I get a? Amen. You're getting there. You're getting there. You get any louder and you're going to start making those Bible study classes thinking, what's going on in this worship service? They're going to hear you. You know, I, one of my favorite movies is Chariots of Fire. How many of you have ever seen Chariots of Fire, that movie? Most everybody here has seen it. I love that movie about Eric Little who became a, a missionary in China. And, you know, he, he won uh, Olympic gold. And, but you'll remember that, that they quote him. And it actually comes from his life. Eric Little was the one who said, when I, when I run, I feel his pleasure. Do you remember that? They have that line in the movie. It comes from his life. It comes from his biography. When I run, I feel his pleasure. And I would say to you today is that when I truly worship the Lord in this place, and you worship the Lord in this place, I feel his pleasure. I feel the pleasure of the heart of God, and it brings pleasure to my heart as well. I'm just telling you today that worship is vital. The second thing I would say to you is that worship is beneficial. Write that down. Worship is beneficial. I, I recognize that a lot of people... And I heard this years ago, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, that a lot of people, when it comes to their religious experience, they are tuned in to WIIFM. A lot of people are tuned in to WIIFM, which is what's in it for me, okay? That's the radio station. And so here's, I want to share with you what's in it for you. If you want to know, well, how does it help me? Okay, that's a good question. I'll tell you how it helps you. When we worship sincerely and regularly, first of all, we gain a sense of perspective. We gain a sense of perspective. We see things more clearly when we publicly gather for worship. That's what happened to Isaiah. Remember Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6? Uh, here he is, and he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and then suddenly he has a sense of what he was supposed to do. He says, here am I, send me. He had a sense of his purpose. He saw things more clearly when that happened. There's something about us, I think, I think in this day and time, especially this past year, where we can get into a fog spiritually. I mean, literally a fog spiritually, where we're just not thinking very clearly, and we're not feeling very clearly, and it just feels like our spiritual life is, has had a fog move in. But there's something about worship in which it's like there's this wind that comes from heaven that the, that the Holy Spirit brings, and it blows through our life, and it blows the fog out of our life and out of our minds and out of our heart, where suddenly we can think more clearly, and we can feel for the Lord more purely, and we need that in our life. It is something about worship that gives you a sense of perspective on life. That is one of the benefits. A second benefit is that we gain a sense of peace. We gain a sense of peace. I don't know what it is about worship, but I've experienced this all of my life, and that is worship brings tranquility, which helps us deal with adversity. Somebody ought to write that down, okay? I'm just telling you. Worship brings tranquility, which helps us deal with adversity. How many of y'all have been through adversity in the last year? Just raise your hand, okay? Most everybody here is telling the truth, okay? You know you have. Worship is one of those things that brings you a sense of peace, a sense of tranquility, which helps you to cope with the, the troubles and the adversity of your life. And that's what the Bible promises. Isaiah uh, 26, verse 3, one of my favorite verses. I learned this when I was 17 years old. It was my verse when I went to college at 17. And that, that's, I meditated on this verse every day. And that is, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Isn't that a great verse? It goes on to say, trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord God is everlasting strength. When I went to college my first year, 17 years old, and, and I found out what all I was going to have to do during that semester, you remember they give out the, not the syllabus, they give out the syllabi, 
Okay, every class has a syllabus, which means you got like, I had like six classes. I got syllabi. And I thought, when am I going to have time to have fun if I'm going to be doing all this stuff my first year in college? And I remember being anxious about it and, and worried about it. Pastor, Brady, you remember when you felt that back? Now, never mind. That's all right. You may not. I don't know. But I was so anxious. I remember just being, I'd never been worried in my life. Suddenly I'm worried and, and God gave me that verse and that became one of the great theme verses of my life and that's what I believe got me through college was that. And I am telling you there's something about worship when we put our minds on him in public worship and also in our private prayer life. There's something about that that brings peace to our lives and I'm all in favor of peace. And worship does that. Worship is beneficial. It also brings priorities. It also brings a sense of priorities. There's something about the worship experience which helps us to realize in our life what's really important and what's not important. And don't you agree with me? We need a little help when it comes to that. Because we're so influenced by our culture. Because of the technology that we experience today that just those electronic beams just come into our minds and our hearts so readily and so easily. And, and we can get to where we adapt something of the world's kind of priorities. And I'm telling you today, our culture's priorities are not right. They are all out of whack. We need worship in order to gain a sense of priorities. It's clear as Jesus in this text, as Jesus stood to read that he knew what he was about. He knew his priorities. Because it tells us there in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, it says that he was to preach good news to the poor. Do you see that? Jesus knew what he was about. But remember, daily he spent time with the Heavenly Father. Weekly he came into the, to the Sabbath experience there in the synagogue. He knew what he was about. He knew what his mission was. He knew what he had come to do. He had a sense of priorities. The very same thing is true of us and not less for us. We need worship in order to gain a sense and to live by a sense of what's really important, to gain a sense of priorities. I'll tell you one other thing that is beneficial, and that is that worship... Uh, brings us a sense of power. It brings us power. Worship somehow replenishes our strength. Admittedly, don't you need your spiritual strength, your moral strength to be re replenished ever so often? I don't believe you can get that by just showing up at church at Christmas in Easter. I could be wrong, but I just don't think. I'm pretty sure that you fill up your car more than twice a year, right? When you drive around. I don't know, some of you during the pandemic, you haven't driven around, so you haven't, you haven't done it much. But when it comes to, to our normal lives, we have to get more than do it twice a year to fill up our table. I'm sure that you go to the supper table more than twice a year as well. Uh, listen, we need worship in order to replenish our strength. You remember Isaiah, Isaiah one of the great passages, Isaiah 40, 31. Uh, the, the, we find there it says that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their what? Their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles and run and not be weary and walk and not faint. That's exactly what happens when we lift up the Lord, when we wait upon the Lord. That's exactly what happens is that he renews our sense of strength. Worship renews the soul as sleep renews the body. Worship gives us a greater strength than we have on our own. And we need to realize that. Now I'm going to tell you something that you may not know but you need to know. And that is that our strength, your strength, and our strength is better when we worship together. Did you know that? God doesn't like lone rangers. God created a family. He wanted this family to come together or else his word would not have told us differently. He says in the word, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, let's put that on the screen. The writer of Hebrews says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And then it adds, as the manner of some is. You know, I have said, I've used, in pastoral counseling, I've told some people that. I said, when you find, as the manner of some is, it's talking about you. I've told people that. Because there, there are some that, that's their manner, as the manner of some is. But instead, encouraging one another, knowing that the day is approaching, the day of uh, Christ's reckoning is, is approaching. So it's saying, not only should we not forsake ourselves coming together, but at the same time, when we come together, we ought to be encouraging one another. When I come on Sunday after Sunday, I come prepared to preach the Word of God to you. I have worked all week to prepare to share with you God's Word. I expect you to work all week to show up on Sunday and to encourage those around you. Is that too much to ask of any of us? Is it? 
Every one of us can be encouragers. Every one of us can, can help people around us. And that is the ministry of gathering together. Worship is an experience of community. Jesus promised this. He promised, are you ready for this? He promised to be there when two or more are gathered in his name. Do you remember that? Now, why would he have said that if we didn't need to gather with two or more? Why would he have said that if we did not need to do that? You see, the Lord wants us together. And he promises to give us certain blessing and certain strength and certain, and certain encouragement that we cannot have if we remain all alone and away from him. And I'm telling you, God expects his family together. Now, by the way, people ask me for the last year, do you think this thing's going to, this pandemic thing, you think it's going to go on? Is, is, is this the new norm? Is this the way it's going to be? I said, absolutely not. Why? Because God does not contradict his scripture. He wants his family to be together. And I said, there's going to be a way out of this, and God is giving us a way out of this. Amen? Amen. He wants his family together. And I knew that he was going to do that. And that's exactly what's happening here. I am telling you today, worship will make a difference all together when we worship together. We'll find strength and encouragement in life. I am telling you today that worship is vital. Secondly, worship is beneficial. Third thing, the final thing I'm going to share with you, because I'm giving you a mouthful today, and some of you are getting cramps in your fingers. I can see that trying to write. You haven't been writing now for some time. You're getting cramps. The third thing I would say, the final thing, is that worship is purposeful. Worship is purposeful. Our worship experience here is purposefully designed for us to experience certain things. We don't come here and do nothing. We come here and do something. Uh, the first thing is that it's designed for us to catch a fresh vision of the Lord. A, a fresh vision of the Lord. In worship, the focus is not on us, but it's on Jesus, right? It's on Jesus. In, in Luke chapter 4, verse 20, our text, it tells us there in the passage, look at it, it says, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on Jesus. Luke 4, verse 20. And that's exactly what we must do. We must catch a fresh vision of the Lord because the Lord is the one who changes our lives. You know, I learned a long time ago that we can do church without the Lord. You know that? We can. We can, we, can, we can go through the motions. We can show up, go through the motions, sing the songs, pray the prayers, sit there and at least pretend like we're listening to the sermon. We can go through it with, with, and do it without the Lord. We can do that. But that's not the way we're supposed to do it, is it? I heard about a little boy at his bedside. He prayed that night, just praying out of his heart. He said, dear God, I had a good time in church today. I just wish you had been there, you know. Out of the mouths of babes. You know what? What we really need Sunday when we show up, we need to have a fresh vision. We need the Lord to be there in our experience, right? We need to seek the Lord in this place. I don't care whether you look at me or not, but I want you to look up and see the Lord every Sunday. Amen? Because he's the one who can make a difference. So it's designed for us to catch a fresh vision of the Lord. Secondly, to hear the voice of the Lord. We need to hear the voice of God. You say, well, how does God speak to us? It is through the Word of God. It is the Word of God that makes a difference when it is received with obedience. Listen, I've lived long enough, and you have too, to know that it doesn't really matter who's up here preaching. I mean, the preachers come and go, and teachers come and go. It's, it's not about any preacher or anybody who would proclaim, and, and I recognize that. It's about the Word. This is what really matters. It's always been about the Word. We just need somebody who preaches the Word of God. We need to get a fresh Word from the Lord. And I recognize that. We need to hear from God. You need to hear from God daily in your private experience as well as when you come to this place. I pledge to you when I stand before you, I'm going to preach the Word of God, but we need to listen for the voice of the Lord speaking to us and be obedient to that. It's designed for us to catch a fresh vision of the Lord, to hear the voice of the Lord, also for us to lift up our voices to the Lord. It's designed to do that. We need to raise our praise to God. We need to worship through our prayers and through our music. You know, the important thing to me, and, and I'm just being honest with you, the important thing to me is, is not really the style of worship, but it's the sincerity of worship. 
I've had the opportunity as a, as a pastor to go to other countries. And what I've discovered when I go to other countries is that, is that the style of worship is different wherever you go. I've studied the history of worship, and I've come to realize that in every century, worship is actually different, the styles, the choices of songs. And all of this has changed since the first century to, 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 the, uh, to the 21st century. Wherever, whatever time frame you're in, it, there's different styles, and there's different music, and there's different places. When, when we go to, to uh, whether it's to Cuba or to the Dominican Republic or, or wherever we go, we discover that the people there usually worship in the style of music that is popular, that is comfortable for them in those places. And I really enjoy that because I, I can tell you right now, I love all kinds of music. Some of you are going to laugh at this, but actually one day when I was coming to work this week, I was listening to rap music. I, I kid you not. I was listening to rap music. Now, admittedly, it was coming from a guy's stereo that was about a mile away, and I just couldn't help it, but... Truth, the truth is, though, there are different styles, but the important thing is that we worship in spirit and in truth, right? Spirit means sincerely. I want you, when you gather in this place, please, please, please come prepared to worship from your heart in your prayers, in your songs, and as you listen to God's word. That is what I ask of you. Come with your heart. Lead with your heart. Amen? And we're going to worship in truth. We're going to use God's word, and we're going to... We're going to Rightly divide the word of God in this place, which isn't always done in our day and time. But we're going to do it here because we're going to worship not only in spirit, but we're going to worship in truth. And all God's people said what? Amen. Amen. Wow, I'm getting excited, man. I tell you, too bad my time is about to run out. Well, let me just say one other thing here about this. We're talking about worshiping purposefully, and that is we need to obey the commands of our Lord. We need to obey. The, that's part of worship. Real worship leads to decisions about God in life. Never come to a worship experience. In fact, I'll take it a step further. Never go into a Bible study class experience without committing yourself to some action. You should, the, the, every time you hear the word of God preached, you ought to be pledging yourself to be obedient to the word of God. To make a decision for God in your life. I preach, I just tell you from my heart to yours, I preach to convince. The Holy Spirit works to convict. But your job as a worshiper is to commit. Let me say it again. I preach to convince. The Holy Spirit works to convict. Your job as a worshiper Sunday after Sunday is to commit. You must make the decision to surrender to what God is speaking to your heart. Can I get an amen on that? Okay, now, we're going to bring this kind of to a close here. I want to point out a couple of things. I stopped reading in verse 21. If you get got your Bible still open, I want you to notice something kind of amazing here. In verse 22, I stopped where Jesus is beginning his sermon, and I didn't really go into his sermon. But as he began to preach in verse, after he closed Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, and began to preach, look what happened in verse 22. This is in his home church. It said, all spoke, as he's preaching, all spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they ask? Doesn't that sound like a hometown church, doesn't it? Little G, I saw little Jesus grow up in the nursery here. Look at him now. He looks really good. Well, Jesus goes on in the next few verses, I'll translate to to say that the gospel was meant for more, the, the, the kingdom of God was meant for more than just the house of Israel. He gives two illustrations of people outside of Israel that receive the kingdom of God and are blessed by God. And he's saying he was preparing them to, to understand that the good news is for all people. Well, that message was not re- well received from this young preacher Jesus. And the reason I know that is look what happened by the time he finished the sermon. <laughs> look at verse 28, how the hometown people responded. All the people in that synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of town. My goodness, talk about turning on the preacher. And they took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the hill. But he walked right through the crowd and went his own way. Suffice it to say, they were not obedient to the sermon, were they? They were, they were interested in hearing little Jesus who grew up there, but not the Lord Jesus. And that makes a big difference. When we show up in church in this place, we ought to each Sunday surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, it's not my will, but thy will be done. 
and we ought to be obedient to Scripture, even if it goes against something we're already doing, especially if it goes against something we're all doing. We ought to be obedient to God. Amen? Amen. 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 Boy, I tell you, I've enjoyed preaching on worship today. You've been great today. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you. Thank you, guys. You're very encouraging. I've shared this story with you before, but but when I was pastoring in Louisiana, we had one of those Sundays where it just seemed like the windows of heaven were open and God was blessing and the music and the worship and the fellowship, even before the church. It just seemed like the church was especially alive that day. And there was a little, there was a little kid that was there in church for the first time. A neighbor, a Sunday school teacher brought this neighbor kid, his name was Danny, and Danny showed up at church for the very first time and you know, little, little Dan is actually what we called him, but his, his name was Danny, and he showed up, and, and he, he, went to, he went to Sunday school, then he came to church, and, and he was sitting there, and I'm telling you, the, the church was just alive that day, it was electric, it was easy preaching that day, I mean, everybody was just on fire, and it was just like, you could just feel the electricity that day, it was happy and joyous, and, and, and right, in, 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 right in the middle of everything, I mean, I'm sitting there preaching, and, and right in the middle of everything, Little Dan gets up to go to the bathroom, okay? He doesn't know the church. He'd never been in church before. He gets up to go to the bathroom, and he's sitting about third or fourth row there, and he gets up, and he comes down there. When he gets right there, he holds up his hand, and, and I just stop. I'm preaching, and I just stop because the little kid is up there with his hand up, and he says, wait, I'll be right back. <laughs> True story. <laughs> so so, so I, I said, I said, I guess I ought to wait for him. And he went to the bathroom, and about two minutes later, he came back. And I said, okay, I'm going to keep praying. And the, and the whole thing just broke out into applause. It was just great. And, and, but I thought, what a joyous thing. This kid was having so much fun. He didn't want to miss anything, did he? And that's the way worship ought to be. And it? it ought to be electricity in this place. As we honor our God, as we worship him, as we preach God's word, this ought to be a fun place, a joyous place, a dynamic place to the glory of God. Can I get an amen? Amen? Amen. May God help it to be this way, to his honor and glory. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Dear Father, you are so good to us. and Everything that we know about you speaks of your goodness and graciousness. And Lord, we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And today we give praise to you, Lord, for all that you mean to us and all that you bring to us. God, thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ that tells us that, that our Lord and Savior, he died on the cross for our sins was buried and rose on the third day so that we might be forgiven of our sins. This is our faith in him. And this is our celebration today that we are forgiven through Christ Jesus. And so today we just want to honor you and bless you and love on you. God, help us to be a great, great worshiping church to your glory and honor. And Father, this we pray in Jesus' sweet name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's respond in worship. Seems appropriate this morning. Would you stand with us?
just as I we can do to be accepted by Christ, only by the blood of Jesus. And we give thanks for that this morning. We thank you so much for being here. Uh, Pastor Ron is going to be out in the, the garden room as you leave. If you walk out to your left, if you're brand new and want to meet him, we'd love to uh, have that conversation. If you're here and you need to take that first step of worship, and that is trusting Christ with salvation. Grab one of these red bags on your way out. We'll be glad to follow up with you. On your way out, the ushers will be there to receive your offering. And we um, thank you so much for being here and worshiping with us. And we'll see you next weekend. God bless you.